Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody here this morning. Glad you're here. Thank you, band. Isn't our band awesome? Yeah, we have an awesome band. Singers aren't bad either. So we are continuing our Entertaining Angels series. It comes from the passage. It says, be hospitable or show hospitality to everyone because many of you have entertained angels and you were unaware of it. So that's where the title comes from. And we're talking about the different roles of angels in our world among the church. And last week we learned that all angels, all angels have a job and their job is to minister to us. How many can tell me, uh, we said this last couple of weeks, but at least, how many angels are there at least? A hundred million. 10,000 times 10,000. So, a lot of angels, a lot of ministry going on behind the scenes. And uh, for your entertainment this morning, I'm going to tell you a joke. <clears throat> that was a good one? <laughs> okay, there was this blonde, and she died and she went to heaven. Now, are there any blondes there? No, no blondes. No, no, no blondes. So this blonde went to heaven, and um, God met her at the gate, and, she, and he said, okay, uh, this is how it works. This is a very biblical joke, by the way. There are going to be ten angels, and he said, every angel is going to tell you a joke, and if you can get through all ten angels without laughing, all ten jokes without laughing, then you can get in to heaven. Very biblical, theological. Uh, so she goes to the first angel, and the first angel tells her the joke. She doesn't laugh. Then she goes on to the second angel, and the second angel tells her a joke, and she still is able to keep her composure. She's still not laughing. She goes to the third, and the fourth, and the fifth, and all the way through the ten, all the way up to the tenth angel, and she is still not laughing. And the tenth angel begins to tell his joke, and she bursts into laughter, and he says, "Is it that funny?" And she said, no, I just got the first joke. <laughs> I can't believe you laughed at that. Some of you don't, like, you don't like that joke? Okay, an Auburn fan died and went to heaven. Is that good? All right. Or Alabama, depending on. Oh, a little boo, some boos and hisses. Okay, back to the sermon. So today we're talking about angels and angels as warriors. Angels as warriors. Um, there is a story in the Old Testament that talks about the angel armies. So we sung that song this morning. That's my favorite worship song, by the way. And I don't, I've had trouble with my voice for about a year now, and I, I'm just getting back into singing. And I didn't do a very good job with it this morning, but that is one of my favorite songs. I love that song. The God of angel armies is on our side. You like that? Amen. So that song comes out of a story in the Old Testament, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you through that story this morning where the angel armies were at work twice in this one story. First thing I want you to know is that the battle... The battle is in the Spirit. Our battle is in the Spirit. It's not a battle that goes on out here, mostly. It's mostly a battle that goes on in here and in here, between our ears. There's a, there's a huge battle, and this is where we wage war. I want to share with you, this comes out of Ephesians <clears throat> Six and it's Paul. He says, "For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. That means people. The enemy is not people, 
but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Do you see where the, where the battle is taking place? The battle is taking place in the spirit. So the battle is in the spirit. The battle is in the spirit. So um, the story that I want to tell you today comes out of 2 Kings. And uh, we'll, just, we'll just get right into that. The, now, the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such, a, such and such a place. And so what was going on here is Elisha, the prophet, um, was hearing from God about the enemy, the army of Aram. And, and Every time they moved, everywhere they went, uh, Elisha had special knowledge about this. And so he was able to um, make the army of Israel privy to all of this information. They knew where the enemy was at all times. And so they always had the advantage. So the king of Aram was uh, inquiring about this. And they said, there's this prophet guy, Elisha, and he's letting the army of Israel know everywhere we are. That's what's going on here. That's why they have the advantage. That's why they always know. And so he got really angry and he said, <clears throat> he said, go find out where he is, where Elisha is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back. He's in Dothan. Who knew? <laughs> He's in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. Now, when the servant, this is the servant of Elisha, the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. And he said, don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Elisha could see that there, were, there was an angel army there. He could see it, but his servant could not. So Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire around Elisha. So that's not the end of the story, and there, there's a lot more to that story, and you can go read it for yourself. Uh, it's a really great story, but I'll give you a little short synopsis. Um, so Elisha asked God, he said, blind the army, uh, the Aramean army. Would you blind them, close their eyes so that they cannot see? And God blinded the army, and so... Uh, Elisha went out to the army and he said, the man that you seek is not here. He said, but I'll show you where he is. Follow me. And so they followed him uh, and he led them right into the city that was surrounded by the army of Israel. And then God opened their eyes to see so that they could see that they were surrounded by the enemy. And so they asked, well, should we, should we kill him? And God said, no. Feed them and send them back home. So that's what they did. They, they gave them a good meal. And instead of killing them, they had mercy on them. And they sent them back home. And so the, uh, this enemy, the, uh, the, this enemy left um, Israel alone for quite some time. They, they, they decided not to go back and attack them. And then... The king decided one day that he would go back and he would surround the city this time. And he would uh, not allow any food in. And so that's what happened. So he, he goes uh, with his army and he surrounds the city, uh, the city where the, the army of Israel was at that time in Samaria. And he does not let any food in. And so there was a great famine inside the city and people were at, at actually just starving to death in the city. And so 
This is, this is the story that is within the story. I've heard like a hundred sermons at least in my lifetime on this story within the story. And the story within the story is about the four lepers who were outside the city gate. There, there was starvation inside the city. They were at the city gate. And they thought to themselves, should we go into the city or should we go to the Aramean camp? Well, which what should we do? And so this is the conversation of the four lepers. And there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. They said to each other, why stay here until we die? And in the old King James, it says, why sit we here until we die? Why sit we here until we die? I've heard a hundred sermons on that. Sometimes you just have to do something. Sometimes you just need to make a move. Right? And so this is what they were saying to themselves. If we, stay, if we say we'll go into the city, then the famine is there and we will die. If we stay here, we will die. So let's go over to the camp of the Arameans and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, we die. We're going to die anyway. At least we have a chance if we go over to their camp. Their camp. So this was their reasoning. Sometimes we need to reason like that. If we keep on doing the same thing that we're doing, we're still going to get that same result, right? Sometimes we just need to make a move. So at dusk, they got up and they went to the camp of the Arameans. When they reached the edge of the camp, no one was there. Nobody was there. They had left their camp. For the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army. He's gonna, um, so to hear the chariots and the horses and the great army, the sound of them. So here is the army of God, the armies, the angel armies of God again appearing. And so... This is the second appearance in the story of the angel army. And it's the same thing. It's chariots of fire and horses and a great army. And they heard the sound of it. And so they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and the Egyptian kings to attack us. I'm, I apologize about the blinking. It, uh, we're going to have to get this fixed. Uh, what we've tried so far is not fixed. It. And it's distracting to me. And it's distracting to you. I'm sorry. Okay. So they got up and fled in the dusk and abandoned their tents and their horses and donkeys. They left the camp as it was and ran for their lives. So what, what the scene was here is they had left their donkeys and they had left horses. They had left all of their food stores, their flour, everything that they, that the, the, um, the Israelites needed everything that the army of Israel needed was right there in the camp. There was silver, there was gold, there was food. They, they left their clothes strewn on the roadway and they fled in such a hurry that they left everything behind. And, and so the lepers were able to go back to the city and they were able to say, look, the Arameans have fled, and everything that we need is right here. And so the very next day, uh, everything was basically back to normal for Israel's army. Everything was, everybody was fed. Uh, the flower, the price of flour was back to normal. It talks about all of that, you know, in the scripture. And, and so everything was back. You know, Sometimes it's the very, I thought about this, these, these leper guys. These guys were the bottom of the barrel, you know, in society. They were the outcasts. They were the ones that were unclean. They were the ones that, that nobody wanted to be around. They were the outcasts. And sometimes we need to get in touch with the outcasts. Sometimes we do. Sometimes it's, it's the, the place that you least expect it that God will bring 
you the news that you need. So these lepers brought the best news that they could possibly bring to the city. And everybody, um, it's a long story, but they came out and they sent spies out to see if, if they were indeed gone and they were gone. And everybody was fed because of that. So here's a principle. If you trust in God, you'll have everything that you need. God supplies our needs. The problem is this part right here. This part, if you trust in God, you'll have everything you need. If you trust in God, you'll have everything you need. Um, there's a book that I read many years ago. It's a great book. It's uh, the, a book on angels, and it's called Angels, God's Secret Agents, and it's by Billy Graham. And Billy Graham tells a story in the book about this missionary. The missionary <clears throat> missionary's name was John G. Peyton, John G. Peyton. John G. Peyton and his wife became missionaries, and they went uh, to be missionaries at the New uh, Hebrides, the New Hebrides Islands, and they are literally on the other side of the world. They are off the coast of Australia. So the New Hebrides Islands, and they were on one of these islands in a little house, little uh, missionary outpost there. And th their first night in that house, the local chief of the local tribe of natives that, were, that was there decided that they were going to go and they were going to burn the house down. They were going to kill the missionaries. They didn't want them there. And they were, they were unwelcome. They didn't want them in, in their territory. So they, they came and they surrounded the house and they sat there all night long. And John and his wife, John Peyton and his wife, all they could do was pray. And they prayed all night long, all night long. Lord, save us. Father, please protect us from these natives. Help us. Help us. So all night long they prayed. And all night long the natives sat there outside their house in a perimeter around the house. The next morning, they looked up, and the natives had left. Well, they continued their work there over the next year. And over that span of a year, uh, a lot of the natives came to faith in Jesus Christ. And the chief of that tribe also came to faith in Jesus Christ. And he and John Payton became friends. And so John asked him one day, he said, you know, when we first came here, our first night here, he said, you and your tribe of warriors surrounded our house, but you didn't attack us. And he, he said, I wonder why that was. And the chief said, it was because of all the men that you had with you. And, and he said, what men? And he described them. He said, there were hundreds. He said, hundreds of men with, dressed in white with their swords drawn. Now, that's a true story. And if you search, you'll find a lot of other stories like that story. Because the existence of angels is absolutely real. We, we are interacting with angels. We don't, really, we don't really have a sense of this because we don't see what's going on most of the time. So, when you... Engage the enemy in the spirit. God fights for you. you. You see, John Payton and his wife, they were engaging the enemy, but they weren't doing it outwardly. They were doing it in the spirit. They were, they were praying, and they were engaging the enemy in the spirit. So when you do that, you engage the enemy in the spirit, God fights for you. There's a, a scripture in Psalm 91 that I love, it says, If you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. That's pretty good, isn't it? That's really good. So, if you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you 
to guard you in all your ways. Man, I like that. I like that scripture a lot. Um, when I first became a Christian, I would uh, come to God with a problem. I would come to him and I would say, okay, I'm, Lord, I'm having a problem with this person. Or, Lord, I'm having a problem in my job. Or, Lord, I'm having a problem in school. Or, or I have this, this thing or that thing. I'm having a problem in a relationship. Well, God, in those first couple of years, would, would speak almost every time I would come to him with a problem like that. He would speak the scripture to me, Ephesians 6. He would, he would speak it to me over and over. And at first, those first couple of years, I kept going to the Bible and looking up Ephesians 6. I'm, and I don't have a very good memory, by the way. I'm, I'm not very good at remembering things. I forget names and places and, and all of those things. But when it comes to Scripture, somehow I have this ability to uh, remember Scripture and quote Scripture. And I think that is a, a spiritual thing. But this is an example of me not being able to remember. He would say Ephesians 6, and I would go to Ephesians 6, and I would read Ephesians 6, and I would say, oh, okay, that's what God wants me to do. And then and then uh, later I would come to the Lord and I would say, hey, I've got this problem. And he would speak to me, Ephesians 6. I would say, what is Ephesians 6? And I would go back and I would look it up and, oh, yeah, that's what it is. And after a year or two, I became very familiar with Ephesians 6. And God to this day still, and it, it still amazes me that I don't just pick up my Bible and go to Ephesians 6 when I have a problem. But still, God will say, Ephesians 6. I'll go back to Ephesians 6. Sometimes I'll just remember it, and sometimes I'll go and look it up. But this is Ephesians 6. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And, and Paul maps out here how to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. We need to know that, don't we? That, that we can be strong and mighty and we can have the power of God on our side. But we need to know how to do that. And it's as everything in Christianity, it's simple to understand. It's just hard to do. Right? It's impossible, in fact. It's impossible to do without the Holy Spirit, which empowers us to do all things. So he says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle, here it is again, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against powers, the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's how we fight. This is how we fight. This is how we struggle. Our struggle is not with people. People are not the enemy. That's not our struggle. In fact, if you're having a struggle with a person... You know, sometimes there's, there's nothing you can do to change that person's mind. There's, sometimes there's absolutely nothing you can do to win that person over, especially if that person is bitter. Bitterness is a, you know, that's what comes after anger. And if a person has entered, entered into bitterness, it is almost impossible to reach that person because they have, <clears throat> they're not just angry anymore. You're not dealing with anger. You're dealing with bitterness and bitterness is a really really tough thing to deal with but when when you have a problem with a person there's almost no time that having a Christ like attitude of humility and love and genuine care for the other person there's almost nothing that that that, um, that way, that way of Christ cannot win over. If a person knows that you really and truly care about them, you can, you can say almost anything to them. 
if they know that you love and care about them. And so to humble yourself in a relationship, to humble yourself and to love that person uh, and to deal with whatever the situation is in unconditional love, unconditional respect, unconditional forgiveness. If you're able to do those things almost always, in almost every case, you'll be able to win that person over. So our struggle is not against flesh and blood. All right, let's move on. So, therefore, put on the full armor of God. The armor of God. This is, this is the battle armor that we put on. This is how we get the mighty strength and power of God working in our favor. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. So the first thing he says is stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. The, the belt is what holds everything. The belt is your foundation. The belt is what holds the sword. It's, it's what holds your pants up. You know, you need, you need a belt. It's foundational. Truth. And Lene and I were just talking this week. We, we, we faced a situation this week that was beyond our control. And it was one of those situations. It was concerning Lene's mom. And it was one of those situations. We, we had no control over the situation. And we needed God to intervene. We needed God's help. We needed grace. We needed mercy. We needed help. And so we just prayed. And we prayed a lot. And Lene said to me at, at some point, she said, So when we go into this meeting, should we, what should we say? Should we say this or should we say that? And I said, you know, we should... Just tell the truth. I said, the, we just need to start with truth. We need to be absolutely truthful in this whole thing and start with truth. Truth is your foundation. And like I said, if someone knows that you love them and you care about them, if someone knows that, you can say just about anything. You can tell them the truth in love, as the scripture says. So start with the belt of truth. And then with the breastplate of righteousness in place, that is what covers your heart, your vital organs, your lungs, the breastplate in place. You need this righteousness of Christ. Now, we're not always 100% with the righteousness of Christ, but we, we do have this ability uh, by the Holy Spirit to do the things that Christ preached and taught us to do. And one of the things that's happened in this church is, um, and I'm, I'm about to make a video about this, but <clears throat> one of the things that's happened in this church is people ha that, that have come to this church for a while, they become disciples. At, in the beginning, I thought, Man, I want to make disciples like the scripture says. All the churches say, I want to make disciples, right? They all say that because that's what Jesus told us to do. He said, go and make disciples. All churches want to do that. And so in order to do that, we have discipleship programs. And I thought in the beginning that we really needed a good discipleship program. And I, I had a plan for a discipleship program. And I thought it was a pretty good plan. But what I found is after a time... I was looking around and I was seeing people are becoming disciples without the discipleship program. What, what's going on here? And as I questioned people and we talked, some around the table back in the back uh, at Compass, um, as I had conversations with people, I realized that really it's just teaching what Jesus taught. The very difficult teachings of Christ is what moves mountains in our lives. So, so it's, not, it's not 
learning more about the Bible. I, I, I love the Bible. You know that I love the Bible. I do this every week. I love the Scripture. But this is alone, studying that it alone is not what changed my life. It was putting those things, those very difficult things that Jesus taught into practice. That is what changed my life. And that is what will change your life. It's not, it's not really any different than any, any other principle, any other thing in your life. If, if you want to get healthy, uh, change your diet. That's hard, right? That's hard. But it yields big results. It's hard to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning before work and go to the gym and work out. But if you do that consistently over uh, several weeks and months, you'll see a change in your body. I, I've been working out almost every day for a while now. And I got on scales this week. I hadn't been on scales in a while. And I was like, oh, wow. Uh, I don't weigh as much as I did a few weeks ago. And it's just because I'm doing something that's hard to do. It's doing the right thing. And the right thing is almost always difficult, is it not? It's almost always difficult. So, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, this is the teaching of Christ. This is the righteousness of Christ. And this will protect you, I promise. It will protect you. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Your feet fitted with a readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. We need peace in our lives, don't we? If you have peace, if you have peace, God can send you into almost any situation. Your feet can take you into almost any situation if you have peace. Peace, if you have the real peace of God, the authentic peace of God, you need to be ready for whatever God sends you to. How do we do that? It's with the gospel of peace. And Jesus said, I'm leaving you my peace. I'm giving you my peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So take up this shield of faith. Anybody ever experienced any flaming arrows of the enemy? Yeah. I mean, the enemy will fling these arrows, and most of the time it's in the form of words. Who do you think you are? Yeah. You're not qualified. How, are you qualified to teach this group? Are you qualified to lead a small group? Are you qualified to lead this serving group? Are you qualified to serve? Who do you think you are? Listen, those are the flaming arrows of the enemy. And with the shield of faith, you can say, No, I'm not qualified, but Christ is qualified. Christ is qualified. I'm not here in my own name. I'm here in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm not doing what, what God has called me to do. I'm not doing that in my own name, under my own power, because of my own ability. I'm doing that because Christ called me to do that. And greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So I can overcome. That's faith. And you have to talk to yourself. The shield of faith is not something magical and unattainable as a shield of faith is something that happens when we talk to ourselves, when we talk to the enemy, when, when someone tries to convince us otherwise and we come back with, look, I, I know I'm not qualified, but Christ is. I'm just a willing vessel. That's faith. And being willing to step out, being willing to do whatever it is that God calls you to do. Just the willingness is operating the shield of faith. And the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. The helmet of salvation. What is the helmet of salvation? It goes over your head. It is the mind of Christ. Do not be conformed to the world. 
right? Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind? Well, uh, Scripture, I, I recommend daily Scripture reading and daily prayer. It just, if, you, if you're busy, just even a few minutes a day. Just a few minutes of doing curls every day will change your bicep. Just a few minutes of, of doing something every day as a habit will change you. And so I recommend reading scripture. I recommend prayer. And I recommend self-talk. I re- recommend that when, uh, whenever you're feeling down, you're feeling low, you're feeling depressed, you're feeling like uh, things are crowding in on you in your life, to just stop and pray. Stop and Google. Google is so awesome because you can just say, I'm feeling, I need a scripture because I'm feeling depressed. I need a scripture because I feel inadequate. What does the Bible say about this? What does the Bible say about that? And you can go straight to those scriptures. Uh, so, So the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. What is the word of God? The word of God is what God speaks to you. So a lot of people um, will take the Bible, and, and they think this is very spiritual and very righteous, but they'll take the Bible and they'll say, and they'll say this is the word of God. This is the word of God. The word of God says this. The word of God says that. The word of God, the word of God, the word, word of God. And if you listen to them long enough, you'll begin to understand that they are actually worshiping the Bible. They're actually worshiping the Bible. And this is what Jesus said about that. He said to the Pharisees, he said, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But you will not come to me that you might have life. I knew a guy in Montgomery who absolutely worshipped the Bible. And I could not get through to him. If, if, if I tried to talk to him about it, he would think that I was committing some kind of blasphemy because I was saying something that the Bible wasn't. So when you, when you read the scripture and God speaks to you out of that scripture by his spirit, that, that is the word of God. When, when you are praying and God speaks to you out of that prayer, that is the word of God. Jesus is so important to come to Jesus because Jesus is the Word made flesh, right? The Word of God is so much more than words on a page. If the Word of God was only words on a page, then we would be able to take that and manipulate it and use it any way that we wanted to, but that is not God. That is not God. God is has given us the holy scriptures to speak to us in thousands of different ways. But we are not to worship the Bible. We are to worship Christ who is the word made flesh. And so, when we take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, it's not just the Bible. It's everything that you've experienced with Christ that you can go back to. You can go back to uh, what, what Christ told you or what, what God taught you about a certain thing whenever you need it. And, and so you're going through, uh, you're going through a, a certain problem and you need some type of weapon. You need something to help you in the spirit. You can go back to any one of those experiences and you can say, this is what God has told me. This is what I understand about God. That is the word of God, and that is our weapon. Everything else is defensive, but that, that is our weapon. What we've learned through Scripture, what we've learned through prayer, what we've learned through operating in the Spirit. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. 
With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. So, <clears throat> say it again. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. What is he saying? He's saying pray. Pray, 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 pray. That's what those, um, that's what those missionaries did. They prayed all night long. And God saved them. So he's saying on all occasions, in every situation, all the time, pray for everyone. So pray, pray, pray. I have a friend right now who uh, he just cannot get connected to God. He, he, he believes in Christ. He believes in reading the scripture. He believes in serving. He believes in serving. He believes in doing everything that Christians believe in doing except for one thing. He does not believe in prayer. He doesn't believe that he has to pray. He doesn't believe that that, he just doesn't see how that's going to help him to talk to the thin air. He He doesn't see it. And because of that one thing, because he cannot be convinced by his friends and his family that he needs to pray, he is disconnected from God, and he wonders, why don't I feel God? Why, don't I, why am I not like the rest of you? I just can't get there. I'm not sure why. And Well, you need to pray. Well, I, I just don't see what good that's going to do. Well, pray on all occasions for all people in every situation. Pray. That is the answer. So... Um, That's the warrior angel way. That's the warrior angel way. That's the angel army's way is the the full armor of God. Uh, Before I end today, I just want to say that, uh, that I have not forgotten about the lost. We talked about the lost here a few weeks ago, and everybody got excited about that. And I have not forgotten the lost. This week, I did um, seven videos. Um, every single video, and you're going to see these. You're going to see them on social media. You're going to see them on YouTube ads, probably. You're going to see them uh, on television. Um, we're doing a. We're doing a. Um, uh, 12 Days of Christmas with WAFF, so you'll see that. Uh, I'm going to be on uh, one of their television shows. I'm not sure the name of the show, but it comes on at 11 o'clock, 11 a.m. on the 5th of December, so I'm, I'm going to be doing that. And you're going to see these videos, and these videos are aimed straight at unbelievers. They're aimed straight at the lost. So when you see it, they're not... They're not aimed at you. They're not aimed at believers. They're aimed at unbelievers. They're aimed at the lost. And so I haven't forgotten about that. That's something that we're going to be doing. Um, so, so this last week, I, I was able to do those videos. We're, uh, I'm doing the editing part now, and they should be coming out this next week. And so you're going to see those. And here's what I want to ask you. I want to ask you to to just re-ask you to do the, the, that same thing that I asked you before. Please think about what you can do, what you can do to reach the lost. Can we do that? All right. Let's pray.